Amen. Thank you, Karen. Good morning. It's good to see everyone, and those of you joining us online, we're glad to have you join us as well. Let's all stand as we sing together our call to worship this morning. There is power in the blood and down at the cross. Thank you, Brother Doug. Well, good morning. Good to see so many smiling faces this morning. Nice, sunshiny Sunday morning. A few announcements as we get started. Uh, the skeet shoot was moved to May 8th because Saturday was a rainy day. No, we don't want to stand out there in the rain, do we? So uh, Saturday, May 8th at 10 a.m. Uh, is our rain date for that. So whoever signed up, please be there for that. There's still time to sign up, right? We can add more to the list. And then Sunday night worship services start at 6.30 p.m. We'll be continuing in the book of Acts tonight, chapter 1. So uh, if you want to read up on that, be ahead of the game. That's tonight at 6.30. And then Sanctuary Choir is back, and, and rehearsals are on Wednesdays from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. And I saw a pretty good little crowd in here Wednesday. I, 16, why, that's pretty good for for the first meeting, right? Amen. So uh, open to ages middle school and up. So if you're interested in uh, being a part of that, what's the requirement, Doug? Uh, if you can speak, you can sing. All right. <laughs> you're in. All right. And then uh, Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. is our family night. It says uh, church. So what? At 6. Oh, that's right. I'm just reading the slide. Uh, it is 6, 6 p.m. Uh, Sunday evening services are at 6.30. Wednesday nights at 6. Thank you, Dan. Church isn't something you go to. It's the family you belong to. Amen? That's right. And uh, good food is part of that. Amen. And then uh, 
The senior trip, the May senior trip is May 4th at 9 a.m. heading to the Cotton Mill Exchange in Canton. Sounds like a fun trip. The cost is $12 for lunch. Be sure to sign up because there is limited seating on the buses. All right, and then uh, it's not too late to sign up for the CLC Run for the Sun. I think it's pretty close. I think we might we might still be in the lead, but it's pretty close. We're not no longer in the lead. We got, man, Anna's going to be working the table out here today after church. Everybody stop and sign up again. I'm, <laughs> if, if you if you haven't signed up for the Run for the Sun and uh, you would like to be a sponsor, if you would like to run in it or, or walk in it or sponsor, uh, please do that. And I'll be working the sign-up table today. The race is Saturday, right? May 1st. Saturday, May 1st. So this is the last Sunday. we got to bring that trophy back home. It belongs here. It's going to be sad if it's not here. So, all right. If you, if you have a graduating senior, high school or college, uh, you can contact Heather and, and let her know about that. Or you can tell me or Dan. Uh, we're one, we would like to do a graduation appreciation uh, pretty soon. So if you know anybody that's graduating, please let us know. And then uh, there's a first aid seminar coming up. That's CPR, the AED, and the Stop the Bleed class. That's May 5th from 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And there's a sign-up sheet for that out in the foyer. It's good to have a lot of folks that know how to do that. And then if you're interested in joining the emergency response team, uh, we need volunteers in these areas. There's also a sign-up sheet for that out in the foyer. And then uh, m on Mother's Day, we're going to have a breakfast in between the morning Bible study and the worship service. That'll be from, or that's, that's before the morning. Did, between the early service and the, okay, between the early service and the Bible study in the fellowship hall. So uh, mothers, join us for that. That's May 9th. And men, we're going to need some men to serve, too, so if you'd like to do that, that's May 9th, between the early service and morning Bible study. Well, it's good to be with y'all. Looking forward to the message this morning. Well, good morning. So glad to see you here in God's house today on this beautiful Sunday, seeing some folks continuing to come back. What a blessing it is to have people in God's house and worshiping Him Grateful for the rain yesterday because we needed to knock down some of that pollen, but uh, even more gladder for the sunshine today. Bad grammar absolutely intended. So, so glad you're here with us today to worship God in His house. If you're here for the very first time, we welcome you. We're so glad to have you with us. On the back of the pew in front of you, there should be a card there. You take it out, fill it out, and then later on your way out of the sanctuary, drop it in the offering plate at the door. We'd appreciate it very much, but we are glad to have you worshiping with us. We want to ask God to work in our hearts today. Uh, we, we don't ever want to come to church passively, sitting back and, and, and sort of almost in a posture of, well, God, if you can, bless me. And instead, we want to come into his presence expecting him to bless us today and to minister to us and to meet us where our needs are. All of us come with different stuff, so we want to lay aside those things that might hinder us from worshiping him today and hearing from his word and ask him to do a work in our hearts. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what a blessing it is to be in your house with your people. God, I, I thank you for this freedom that we still have. And If we've learned anything over the last year, Lord, we don't want to take ever take this for granted. But God, help us to be uh, always pursuing you daily, individually, and then as we come together to worship you collectively, God, I pray that our hearts and minds would be focused upon you. <clears throat> Lord, anything that might hinder us from being present mentally right now, God, I pray that we lay those things aside and allow you to minister to us. When we sing, God, help us to focus our attention upon you and sing your praise. And then, Lord, as we hear from your word, may our hearts be open to receive what you want us to hear today. God, do your work in this place and in our lives. It's in your powerful and precious name we pray these things. Amen.
they were told that he would spare their lives if they would renounce the name of Christ. But one by one they chose to die. The song
Amen. Thank you, Judy. I want to ask if we pledge allegiance as we stand and sing about our God. So, Chris Tomlin song. Beautiful song. All right. <laughs> Water you turned into wine Open the eyes of the blind There's no one like you None like you Into the darkness you shine Out of the ashes we rise There's no one like you stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, oh, our God. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, oh, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, oh, our God. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God. Oh, our persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if our God is for us then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us then what could stand against? And if our God is for us then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Powerful scripture from Romans chapter 8. And this next song we want to sing is based on Psalm 23 about surely goodness and, and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. The, the goodness of the Lord. I love you, Lord. 
For your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head oh, I will see of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I Of the goodness of God, I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as In the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you Goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so the goodness of God. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. This time we'll dismiss our children to Children's Church. I ask you to join in singing our next song, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Third and fourth stanzas. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the
Revelation chapter 14, we're going to look at verses 6 through 13 in just a moment. You know, when we sing that song, The Goodness of God, um, I'm kind of glad it's allergy season because uh, my eyes want to leak a little bit on that one. Um, you know, one of the things that we're so quick to do in our Christian walk is when things go well, we say, isn't God good? <laughs> but let me say to you, when things aren't going well, isn't God good? He's good. It's not dependent on how things are going in our life. He is a good and faithful God even when things are hard. Pretty sure that's what Paul meant in Romans 8, 28 when he said that all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God is a good God no matter what we're going through, no matter how things might turn out. That's hard, admittedly, to live out and to walk out, but it is the reality. I know some of you uh, men played football in a time when the high school football teams typically had players that played on both sides of the ball. Uh, a lot of you played uh, in schools and situations where you had to play offense and defense. That mean that there was very, meant that there was very little time for players to get rest. Now, nowadays, uh, basically from AAA on up, you don't see too many players play both sides of the ball, but still some at AA and single A, you'll see some of the players at that level playing both sides of the ball, especially skilled players. If you have uh, at the single A level, it won't be unusual to see a running back turn around on defense and be a linebacker. It won't be unusual to see a quarterback sometimes end up playing safety or corner on defense. So that's not unusual. I've told you before that I came here from a football town, uh, Lincolnton, Georgia, and Larry Campbell was the head coach then. He's the all-time winningest in Georgia high school football history. 11 state titles, 31 region titles, uh, all sorts of stuff, and football is huge there. A good friend of mine now is the head coach there, Lee Homskis, and football is still a big thing there, and it's not unusual for them to have that very scenario. They'll, a lot of their skilled players, they'll play both sides of the ball, and they'll play an entire game, and it's hard to get rest. One of the reasons you try to avoid that is because Sometimes when we get fatigued and we don't get rest, we, we get sloppy. We don't focus. We, don't, uh, we end up with needless injuries. It happens on the, on the ball field when, when people do that or they are not as sharp as they would be. So that's why at the college level and pro level, you very seldom see somebody go both ways. There'll be occasional guys who might come in for a play on offense when they've been a defensive player. For those of you who remember Deion Sanders that played with the Falcons, he did that sort of thing. There are others who do that uh, throughout time, but for the most part, you really don't see that happen. Even in college baseball, um, you'll see the pitcher typically doesn't hit. And the reason for that is the pitcher's doing a lot of work on the mound, but also during the week as he's preparing, as he's going through his drills and his throwing and his conditioning and all that kind of stuff, the coach doesn't want those pitchers to do other things and to be distracted from the main thing because it's easy to over, especially for somebody who throws, if you've got them playing a position in the field and they're making more throws, it's easier to create arm injuries in that respect. So most of the time, a kid, when he graduates high school, if he goes on to college and pitches, he doesn't hit in college. And if he does happen to go to the next level to pro ball, there's literally only one, and I don't know if it's changed now, but there, is, there was only one triple-A league, triple-A, 
that actually had the pitchers hit. So most pitchers who go to the National League have gone from high school all the way to the major leagues without ever picking up a bat in a game. That is why I'm now a proponent of the designated hitter in the National League. I, I wasn't ever that way before, but now that I've seen that pitchers don't hit for all that time, and it's because they need the rest. They need that time. They need that downtime. As we look at this section of chapter 14, we'll see the wicked getting one more chance to repent and find rest in Jesus. I hate to give you the spoiler alert here, but most won't. They won't trust in Christ. But there will be those during the tribulation who place their faith in Christ and they will receive the rest uh, that they have longed for and that rest will be for eternity. So let's take a look at Revelation chapter 14 beginning in verse 6. And if you're able, I'd ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Revelation chapter 14 beginning in verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying high overhead with the eternal gospel to announce to the inhabitants of the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He spoke with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship the one who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. And another, a second angel, followed, saying, It has fallen. Babylon the great has fallen. She made all the nations drink the wine of her sexual immorality, which brings wrath. And another, a third angel, followed them and spoke with a loud voice. If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, which is poured full strength into the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels and in the sight of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will go up forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image. Anyone who receives the mark of its name. This calls for endurance from the saints who keep God's commands and their faith in Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so they will rest from their labors since their works follow them. May the Lord add richly to the reading of his word. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your amazing grace. And God, we pray that as we examine this text this morning, our hearts and minds would be open to hear from you. Lord, I pray right now that I might decrease. God, that you may increase and your truth would be spoken here. It's in the powerful name of Jesus Christ we pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. As we take a look at this text, I want us to examine three calls that we find in this text. Three calls. The first call we find here is a call to rest. A call to rest. Now, the CSB or the Christian Standard Version tells us that John sees another angel flying high overhead, while other translations will say in the midheaven. The Greek word there refers to the point where the sun reaches its apex in the day or the highest point in the sky. So the whole point of what is being said here, what we're being told by John, is the fact that this angel is in a place where everyone can see, where it can be seen readily. And he's at a high point, so high indeed, that the Antichrist can't get to him. The Antichrist can't stop what he's trying to say, what he's going to say, what he's clearly going to communicate. Satan can no longer get to him because at this time Satan has been bound to the earth. He can't go up into heavens and do anything to him. He can only stay on the earth. This angel will not be stopped. His message will not be kept back. You know, nowadays there are a lot of messages out there and I'm grateful for the fact that I have this button on my remote that's mute, this other button that's off, so whenever the media starts talking I can mute it or cut it off. I don't have to listen to it. Uh, kind of like they would like to do to us as Christians when we proclaim the truth of God's Word. I don't have to listen to them. Uh, they don't have to listen to me, but the truth is still the truth whether they listen or not. We cannot let them keep us from proclaiming the truth. In verse 7, we see the message of this angel, fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come. Worship the one who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Folks, I hope you see here in, toward the end of the tribulation as this is all coming to a head, God is proclaiming the good news one more time. Do we not see the mercy and grace of God in that? Do we not see how wonderful our God is that He would actually, in the midst of all this judgment, once again extend, if you will, an invitation, an opportunity for people to come to faith, to repent and go away from their sin and trust in Him. This angel's warning them that time is running out and the opportunity to repent is drawing to a close. And while there's still time, 
He's exhorting them to turn from their wicked ways and trust in the one that can save them from their sin. But if they don't repent in time, they'll miss out on eternity in heaven. A few weeks ago, I found a TV show on our Discovery Plus uh, TV app that that's hosted by Lara Spencer, who some of you may recognize from Good Morning America. Uh, she also hosts another show called Flea Market Flip. But this particular show is called Everything But the House. And basically what happens with this, they have people reach out to them who have these collections in their home that they're ready to sell. It could be uh, classic toys, it could be Barbie dolls, it could be plates or furniture or just any sorts of things they've collected that might have some value to them. Um, I don't have anything like that in my house. Uh, there just there wouldn't be any point in me calling them. But some people have those kind of collections, baseball cards or whatever, and, and they come in with a couple of, she comes in with a couple of appraisers and they look at their stuff and they begin to tell them what they think this might draw on auction. And then once they're done doing that, they'll send their crew in, they'll box this stuff up, they'll take it back to their warehouse, they'll take pictures of it, and they'll put it on an online auction. Now on that online auction, the one sort of scary little caveat is that everything starts at one penny. Everything that you put on there, somebody can bid one penny on it, start the auction, and, it's, and they, if nobody else bids on it, they can get it for a penny. Now, they've never shown any, I've only seen about three shows of it, so they've never shown any that only went for a penny, but they put these items up and people begin uh, to bid on these items. Now, uh, later in the show, they come back and they sit down together in this room and they present it as though they're watching the end of this live auction taking place. It's my suspicion... <laughs> skepticism uh, on my part, but it's my suspicion that they're not actually watching it live. They take the ones that had a bunch of excitement toward the end and they pull those together through the miracle of editing. And then they watch those exciting bids as they come down to the last. And it's amazing how the last 30 or 45 seconds, you'll see some of these items literally jump hundreds, maybe even a thousand or more dollars in the last bids because the people who really want them, they're jumping in at that last moment. They're trying to make sure they don't miss out on these items that they want. Every episode that I've seen thus far ends with the owners actually making more than they thought they could make in the beginning on that process. Uh, there have probably been some others, but they didn't show, I hadn't seen any of those yet. But anyway, too many people are playing this sort of game with God, hoping that they can wait till the last minute to put their bid in, if you will. They want to make that deathbed connection. You know, I want to live and have all this fun but don't understand the reality that there is no life without Christ. You can have fun by the world standards, but it'll never meet up to the fullness of life in Christ. And the reality is we don't know when our last breath will be. We don't know when the last time will be on this earth. Life can literally be snuffed out in a moment. You can be healthy one day and gone the next. And we need to make sure that we take care of those things in our life and that we do all that we can to encourage those around us to place their faith in Christ. We need to tell them how they can have the greatest offer ever. There is nothing that you'll be able to give anybody for free that is more valuable than what you can give to somebody through Christ. The greatest thing we can ever do for anyone in this life is to point them to Jesus. It's not our responsibility to save anybody, but we sure have a responsibility to share to point them to Christ, to pray for them, to lift them up, to, to pray that God would do a work in their life. People need to know the reason that we have joy and hope. There's a conditional statement right there. <laughs> We're supposed to have joy and hope. As followers of Christ, we should have joy and hope. And if we don't, we need to spend a little more time in our prayer closet asking God to give us that joy and hope so that others will see Him in us. But don't ever let it stop at your actions. You know, some people will say, well, you know, preacher, I'm a witness with my life. Well, that's great, but you need to be a witness with your mouth too. Our lives should be a witness. As a matter of fact, the way that I live ought to back up what I say. None of us are perfect to that. We need to be honest about that. None of us are perfect. But we should be living in such a way that others see Christ in us, that we have joy and hope because of what He's done in our lives. So the first call we see here is a call to rest. The second call we see here is a call to wrath. Now in verses 8 through 11, we have two more angels that make their way onto the scene. The second angel in verse 8 tells us that Babylon the Great has fallen. He even repeats it to place emphasis on the fact that it has fallen. This is not good news 
for the lost. This is judgment upon the lost. Babylon is the eye of the storm, the headquarters for sin and decadence. This place that the followers of Antichrist have looked to as a bedrock is going to be shaken and destroyed. This announcement will come as a shock to the lost world as the empire of Antichrist will be the most powerful dictatorship or empire in all of history. There's debate over what Babylon is being referred to here. Is it just the city or is it something else? I believe, honestly, the answer, the best answer is yes. I believe it is the city, but I also believe it's the system. It's the economic way of life. It is the religious way of life. It is the government. It is all those things rolled into one. And whether or not you realize it or not, there are an awful lot of people around us today who are very religious but don't know Jesus. They're committed to all sorts of things. They're committed to all sorts of false ideas, but they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The system of the world is all about gratifying yourself and doing what makes you feel better. Unfortunately, there are even those within the church under the umbrella of the name of Christianity within the church who think that God's idea is to make everybody feel better. There's nothing remotely biblical about that. God can bring you joy. God can bring you peace. But he never said he would always make you happy. If he did, then I can think of 11 apostles he needs to apologize to. And God doesn't need to apologize. He doesn't make mistakes. Okay, let me be clear. There are even preachers today who want to water down the Word of God and don't want to be Donnie Downer and talk about sin or the blood of Christ. But we need to know we're all sinners. And we all need the blood of Christ applied to our lives. Every single one of us. I mean, God loves us deeply. And He is more concerned about our eternity and what will grow us than He is about our happiness. You know, the people that think that God always wants you to be happy, there's a Greek word for that. I studied it deeply it's, uh, it's got two words that all mash together in one word. I'll try to pronounce it carefully. Hogwash. I had to study long and hard to get the pronunciation down correctly on that one. Uh, there was a few Greek letters that were tough to work through. But anyway, um, it's not God's plan that all of us would always be happy. As a matter of fact, there are times in our lives when the most growth takes place when it's hard. When things are difficult. I'm not saying I enjoy that, but following God will often lead you into things that are not easy, things that are difficult. I, I don't take great pleasure as a pastor in preaching sermons that hammer away at sin, but I know I need to hear the truth, so I'm working under the assumption that we all need to hear the truth. As a matter of fact, the Word of God makes it clear that the truth is what will actually set us free. So we're going to pursue the truth in what we do if we're going to honor God. Babylon is the site where the Tower of Babel was. Now, John MacArthur says this about Babel. He said, the Tower of Babel, the expression of that false religion was a ziggurat. Now, I did not say cigarette, okay? I want to be clear. That's Z-I-G-G-U-R-A-T. That word means uh, rectangular shaped steps tower, okay? Don't be impressed. I had to look it up. An edifice designed to facilitate the idolatrous worship. God judged the people's idolatry and rebellion by confusing their language and scattering them over the globe. Thus, the seeds of idolatry and false religion spread around the world from Babylon to take root wherever these proud rebels and their descendants settled. This city, Babylon, is the epicenter of evil and is overrun with sexual immorality, and she has led others to accept and celebrate what she does. Make no mistake, this system is fully in place in our nation today. All sorts of perversion of God's design is being perpetuated and normalized in our culture. With time, the speed of acceptance is careening downhill, and things that would have been taboo and spoken of in hushed tones just 10 years ago are not only openly spoken of, but are celebrated and championed. Things like gender dysphoria are being embraced, and people who embrace it are calling those who claim it to 
uh, that they're brave and saying that they're brave. I'm, I'm not suggesting that people don't struggle with gender dysphoria at all. But they need counseling and they need help to overcome it. They need the power of the Holy Spirit working in their lives to see themselves the way that God sees them and loves them and wants to restore them and renew them. What they don't need is hormones and surgery. And please don't tell me a four or five-year-old child can decide that they're not the gender they were born. What kind of sin-sick parenting would do that to their child? Teach them they're made in the image of God. Teach them that God loves them dearly, that He made them who they are, and He has a plan for their lives. The third angel followed with a loud voice and pronounced judgment. God's wrath on those that worshiped the beast and its image or received the mark on their hand or their forehead. He tells them that they will drink the wine of God's wrath undiluted. Now, what's the imagery that's being portrayed here by John? In their day, wine was a significant, important beverage because their water was so bad. They had to mix the wine with the water so that the water could be drunk. They didn't have a, a water that was clean, that was purified like we have. They couldn't run over to Walmart and grab a case of water and you know, take it home and drink it. What, it wasn't like that. The water they had wasn't always ugh, <laughs> anything worth fit to drink, but when they'd mix it with wine, then they could drink it. The other side of that is because of the way they stored things, the wine could become very, very strong. Therefore, they would dilute it by mixing, mixing it with water. The imagery that John is getting at here is he's saying, you're not going to get the diluted version of God's wrath. You're going to get the full cup of the wrath of God. It's going to be poured out on those who have rejected Him. God's wrath will not be watered down. Those who have rejected Him and followed after false gods will face the full cup of His wrath. But next He tells them that they will be tormented with fire and brimstone or sulfur. It won't just be the heat of the fire. It will be the stench, the smell of sulfur. Um, I'm not picking on this city when I mention this city, but if you've ever been near Brunswick, Georgia, in the heat of summer near the paper mills, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It is a strong smell. Now, I grew up in Augusta. I grew up on the south side of Augusta, and I was about 10 miles from a paper mill, and if the mill, if the wind were blowing the right way from that mill, I would smell the paper mill. Now, I realize if you're in the paper business, that smells like money, but to those who are not, it's not a good smell. It's not pretty, but I want to tell you, compared to what's going to be here, that would be welcomed relief. Welcomed relief. To add to this punishment, the angels and our Savior will be an audience for this. Now imagine you've denied Christ. You've said He didn't exist. You wouldn't place your faith in Him, and yet there at your day of judgment sits Christ. Imagine the regret and the remorse that will be felt by those who denied His very existence, and yet He's sitting there and they have to face Him. And we know from the authority of the Word of God that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. They will see Him and they will have that tremendous regret. There will not be anywhere to hide. But notice that verse 11 tells us that the smoke of their torment will go up forever. The smoke of their torment will go up forever. You've heard me say before, and I hope you don't think I made it up, it's right here in Scripture. We all live for eternity. There's not a single person alive on earth today that will not live for eternity. Some will be cast into a lake of fire. Some will spend their eternity in heaven. The decision is up to us. When you reject God, you can count on the fact you will spend your eternity separated from God in a literal hell, in a lake of fire. And the Word of God tells us right here that there will be no rest day or night, no matter how weary, no matter how tired, there won't be any way to stop the pain. From time to time, I'll have migraines. I'm, I'm blessed in that I don't have really severe migraines. There's only been a couple of times in my life where I've had migraines where it was just so bad that all I could do was lay down. Most of the time, if I have a migraine, it's kind of mild and I can still sort of function. doesn't feel good. doesn't feel good at all, but I can sort of function. But sometimes the best thing to do when it gets like that is just to lay down and go to sleep. 
some, sometimes the next day I may have a, a little residual. My head may hurt a little bit the next day, but usually the next day I'm not near as bad as I was the day before after sleeping. I've heard of others who have suffered what they refer to as cluster migraines. And that lasts for days. And I can't imagine how awful that is to live with that for several days at a time. That will be a picnic compared to what's being described here. No rest, no relief for eternity. Kind of makes me think of the time that I had to listen to bagpipes in an enclosed room. It's painful. I'm, I'm sorry. Not, not trying to make light of it at all, but the reality is this will be awful, awful. I want to say to you, if you're listening today, you don't have to be a part of this crowd. You don't have to experience this judgment. Because Jesus did everything to make it possible for you to know forgiveness. All you have to do is ask God to forgive you. You've got to be willing to admit that you're a sinner. (laughs) On the authority of the Word of God, I can tell you the Word of God is pretty clear on this. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Just throwing this out there, kind of a random thought, but I'm pretty sure I'm included in all. Hmm. All. As a friend of mine from seminary years ago said to me one time, you know what all means? All means all, and that's all all can mean. It's it. It means all of us. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Paul goes so far in in the book of Romans to make it clear, for there is none righteous. Uh, Dan, just in case you thought you were, no, not one. Not a single one. None of us are righteous apart from God. When we admit that we're sinners and we ask His forgiveness, we find forgiveness in Him. Not only do we receive forgiveness, but we immediately receive eternal life. Hang hang in there with me. I know these bodies don't last for eternity, but that part of me that is me, it will. This body will be put off one day. Thank goodness. (laughs) And I'll be in heaven with Him. I'll never have an ache or a pain again. I'll never have to worry about those things again. I can honestly tell you, if you give your life to Christ, you will never regret it for a single day. I'm not telling you life's going to be perfect. Don't hear me say that, because that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you won't regret it. But I am saying this as well. If you don't place your faith in Christ, you will regret it for eternity. So we see a call to rest, and we see a call to wrath. But finally, I want you to see call to rejoice. A call to rejoice. Now, look again at verses 12 and 13. This calls for endurance from the saints who keep God's commands and their faith in Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so they will rest from their labors since their works follow them. Those saints that have trusted Christ during the tribulation, they've endured so much. They've endured a lot, but with God's help, they endure it. The proof of their endurance will be in their faith in Jesus and their obedience to God. Faith and works go together. Listen, I am not, you are not, we are not saved by our works. Paul could not make that any clearer in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. It is not of works lest anyone should boast. We're saved by grace but we are saved unto good works. I don't do good works because I want more favor from God. I don't do good works so that I hope I get in. Only because of the grace of God, I can stand here today with absolute 100% confidence knowing that I'm going to get into the kingdom of heaven. Not because I'm good, but because He is gracious. And He paid the price for me. I have forgiveness in Him. I can count on that. I can depend on on him. But I know this because I love him, because I appreciate what he's done for me, I do good works. I want to please him. I want to honor him. Let me confess sometimes my motivation gets skewed. Sometimes I do good works for the wrong reason. Sometimes I want to please somebody or make somebody else happy, or, you know, I'm human. <clears throat> if the Apostle Paul was human, I'm pretty sure I'm going to be human. You read Romans 7, Paul talks all about that struggle with the flesh and trying to do what's right. I struggle there too. Sometimes I get in my flesh and I don't honor God in what I'm doing. God knows my heart. 
If I'm doing things from the wrong motivation, I've already got my blessing. That's what the Word of God says. It'll only be temporal. But if we do things from the right motivation, in the right heart, we're storing it up for eternity. And I praise God for that. <clears throat> but I want you to notice the result in verse 13. They're blessed that they die in the Lord and they will rest from their labors and their works will follow them. That is a place for rejoicing. That's what I was talking about when I said those things that we do from the right heart are stored up. Those things that we've sent ahead, that we've honored God with, God is putting those treasures aside for us. Life can be hard. Life can be difficult. It can be a struggle at times as we try to walk in this life and do what God would have us to do. And we can become very weary in the flesh. Several years ago, the head coach at the University of North Carolina, Tar Heels basketball coach Roy Williams said this, Preachers and coaches have the easiest jobs in the world because everybody else knows how to do your job better than you do. It may be hard to believe this, but sometimes I get worn down spiritually and emotionally. God has called me to this. And I'm humbled and someday scratch my head at why in the world he would choose to use me to do this. I know I'm unworthy and don't deserve it. You need to know I love you and there are times when I'm weighed down because I'm concerned for you. Burdens in your life, things you're going through. Honestly, at times, watching some people not grow in the faith is one of the things that can wear a pastor down so much. And I think there's a biblical principle in that. I think when Jesus referred to the 99 and the 1, <laughs> he, he made it clear that we need to be concerned about those who have wandered from the flock. But I would not trade for a minute what God has called me to do because I know He's called me to do this. And if I ever have a young person come to me and ask me about the ministry and whether or not they're feeling called, my first response to them is if God will let you do anything else, do it. But if He won't, you're called. And I know for me, God won't let me do anything else. Try it. No, I'm just kidding. I know this is what God has called me to do. <clears throat> But I know this as well. One day, we will all have rest like we've never known in this life. Whatever burdens, whatever concerns weigh you down in this present life, those things will be gone. One day, we'll have the joy of simply worshiping our Savior and our King. Nothing will distract from that. These bodies that we have now, we won't have to worry about that anymore. We'll be in God's presence. <laughs> I pray for all of us, but I pray this specifically for myself, that I finish the course, that I finish this race well. I pray that my last days will be my best days. I pray that I run hard through the tape and never look back or give up on this fight. The last thing any of us need to do in the Christian life, I realize as we get older, we don't feel like we can do as much, but we need to continue doing what God allows us to do as long as He gives us a breath in this body and the energy to do it. We need to do it all with everything we've got for His glory. When I stand before Him, I want to hear those words. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Not from pride, but because I know the price He paid for me. I want to stand before Him and know that I have given everything for His glory. He doesn't forsake His own and He won't forsake you. Christian, run the race well. It doesn't matter what happened behind you. You know, on the highest level of a 100-meter sprint, literally a start that just wasn't perfect could separate the guy from another guy at the end of the race. The great thing about the Christian life, it doesn't matter how you started. It doesn't matter what happened yesterday. It only matters right now and what you do going forward. 
Do not let the enemy beat you up about your past. (laughs) He's a liar. Why would you listen to him? Know how God loves you and sees you through the blood of His Son. You are perfect in His sight. And He wants to continue to work in your life and do more through you in the days ahead than have ever been done in your life. Don't get to the end of your life trying to climb the ladder of success and realize you've put your ladder against the wrong wall. God's way is the best way. For Christians, God's way is the only way for us to know the joy and fulfillment of being with Him, in Him, and glorifying Him. Anchor yourself in the Word of God and let God lead you. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, I want to encourage you, don't let this day go by. Don't let this moment go by without admitting to yourself and agreeing with God that you're a sinner and can't save yourself. That's true of all of us. None of us can save ourselves. Christ did everything so that we wouldn't have to. If I have to pay the penalty for my death, I'm going to spend my eternity in the lake of fire. I chose, as a young boy, to let Christ pay that price for me. And I know that as I stand here today, I'm covered in His blood, and I'm forgiven. And He promises me in John 10, 29, that what's in the Father's hand cannot be removed. I'm secure in Him. Not because of me, because of Him. If you've never trusted Him, nail that down today. Place your faith in Him. Whatever burdens, concerns you may have today, lay those at God's feet today. I realize not everybody can come kneel at the altar, but maybe for some of you, maybe that's the step you need to take to really be able to let go of it. That might be the step you need to take. But Whatever you do, let it go and trust it to Him. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You for Your love and we thank You for the amazing grace even in the time of tribulation, God, that You will be showing for those who have yet to trust in you. But God, in the reminder of this, help us to be burdened for those that we know that don't know you. Help us to want to tell them about you. But Lord, to pray for them and and to have an urgency knowing that their time could come to an end at any time, that your return could literally happen at any moment. And we don't want to see anyone we know and love go through this. So God, help us to be faithful in sharing with others how they can know you. God, for any here that don't know you, I pray that right now they'd ask your forgiveness and trust in you. That today they'd know they're forgiven. That today they'd know they have eternal life in you. Lord, whatever burdens or concerns are represented here, I pray we'd have the wisdom to trust those to you right now as well. And allow you through the power of your Holy Spirit to minister to us and meet our needs for your glory. God, we give this invitation time to you and we ask you to have your way in it. It's in your precious name we pray these things. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our invitation hymn.